By Christ's cross and empty grave, you and I are saved. Therefore, you are forgiven in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, 
This is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain. First the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it, because the harvest has come. Again, he said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It's like a mustard seed, which is the smallest seed you plant in the ground. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants, with, with such big branches that the birds of the air can perch in its shade. With many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. But when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. This is our gospel reading for tonight. Please be seated. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you great thanks tonight, gathered in your name, gathered together before you in your presence. Lord, we look forward to the day that we will be gathered into your heavenly, eternal presence. We enter your courts with praise now and forever. Lord, tonight I ask that you would bless the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts. May it be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, it is so good, in fact, we gather with you to worship our Lord here tonight, the God who cares for us, the God who last week we talked about comes to us over and over, to be gathered together with the God who teaches us daily how to grow in Christ. In fact, that is what the focus of this season in the church is all about, about growth the green season, the time of the church, to learn and to grow in Christ, to live in and to work out our sanctified lives in Christ, all while we yearn for more. More understanding, more reliance on God, more love shown to our neighbor, more people hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ, that yearning for more in Christ is a righteous pursuit, and it is one that pleases God. In our epistle reading uh, this week and the last week, Paul is talking about the Christian life here on earth and the struggle that we have here on earth while living out the Christian life in this time that we have before entering into the kingdom of God. What makes Paul such an incredible writer, an incredible mouthpiece for God's word to go out to the church? What makes him so incredible is actually probably the hardest part of his life. Paul was a man who suffered much. In fact, when God was preparing for Paul's ministry, when God was preparing to convert Paul, God spoke to Ananias and explained to him that this man, that this Saul, this persecutor of the church, that God would teach him what it was to suffer for the sake of Christ. And suffer he did. Arrests and beatings and persecution and mockery and hunger and shipwrecks and snake bites and attacks from Satan and an incredible guilt about his sinful past, all of it. All of it makes Paul an incredible mouthpiece for Christ because he over and over and over again compares, contrasts, measures up, and meets out life in this world as it compares to life in the eternal kingdom of heaven. And where Paul excels is that he is very clear, he is unwavering and accurate about the suffering in this life. Last week we heard these words in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. He said this, We do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. This outer self, sometimes Paul calls it the flesh. Sometimes he simply calls it the body. Sometimes our old sinful nature. Sometimes our old sinful life. But always, always, always meaning the same thing. That there is a piece of us, that there is a piece of you, a piece of me, a big piece of us, that is of sin. That is 
of the world. And that piece of us is wasting away, he says. It is dying. It is going away. And on the day of resurrection and in the new creation, it will be gone forever, completely and totally gone, and remembered no more. But for now, that piece of all of us, that part of us, that sinful flesh which clings to us, does in fact drag us down and make us sad and frustrated and scared and angry and hostile. It's the parts of this life we hate. It's the parts of ourselves we hate. It's the things in this world we pray about, and the things we desperately seek to do without. And your friends, we all have it. And we all feel this way about certain things in this world. And we all yearn for something more, something greater, something better, and I'm here to tell you tonight that that yearning for something else, in all sincerity and truth, it is not just okay, but it is good. It is good to feel that way. Why is it good to feel that way? Because it lifts our eyes out of this world. It lifts our eyes out of this momentary affliction. It lifts our eyes out of what we see here, and it lifts our eyes to the world to come. It causes us to yearn for the things of God over and above the things of the world. It pushes us towards the kingdom of God, neither denying the reality of this pain we live in now, nor despairing because of it. We know who wins. And when we call out to God, yearning, groaning, sometimes with words, uh, with groanings too deep for words, says Paul, we say, where are you, Lord? Bring your kingdom here. Bring the heavens and come down. That is very God-pleasing. And it is worshipful. And it is right. We might say as Christians, well, we're supposed to be joyful in that. That's very true. And we're supposed to be content with our life, right? We are. But being content is not the same as being complete. These are different. Being content is not the same as being complete. Being content is good, and it is right, and it is in fact a godly thing. We should be content with what God has given us in our lives, and not in sinful pride obsess over what he has not given us. Being content says, yes, Lord, there are good days, and there are bad days, and I have stuff, and I have blessings, and it all belongs to you. Most of all, I have the biggest, most important blessing of forgiveness and eternal life in your kingdom. And in this temporary life, I recognize whether I have a little or I have a lot, I have everything I need, and all I truly need is you. You can be content and have a little, you can be content and have a lot. But being content is not the same as being complete. Though our inner self is being renewed day after day, our outer self, Paul says, is wasting away. And it is that wasting away that hits so real. And hits so hard for many of us. We are looking for a day where things will be put back right. Where bodies will be healed and put back Right. We're waiting for a day of perfection for our souls, for our minds, for our very own will, that our wills would be, in fact, conformed to Christ's will in all things. The truth is, we are not yet complete. You are not yet complete. Made in God's image, yes. Redeemed by Christ's sacrifice, yes. Made holy by God's grace. Yes. But we are incomplete. Until the resurrection of our bodies and the reunion between 
those bodies and our souls, there is more to come for the believer in Christ. Until we are in Christ's kingdom, there is more to come for the believer in Christ. Until we are again living in the very presence of God, where he will take care of one and every single one of our needs, there is more to come for the believer in Christ, and we are incomplete. And the desire for more, the desire to be complete, the yearning for the completion of God's promises and the beckoning of his kingdom to come is worshipful and highly honoring to your God. And our epistle reading tonight bears this out in a beautiful way. Paul says, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, he says, For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Paul here is borrowing language from and calling remembrance to Israel's history of wilderness wandering, of conquest, and the construction of an earthly kingdom. A tent is good. It gives shelter. It gives warmth, it gives safety, while on the move, while traveling through, a building is better. It is permanent, it is lasting, it gives better shelter, better warmth, better safety, while settled in a place. When Israel was on the move, from place to place to place, the presence of God was with them. God promised, I will be with you. And the presence of God dwelt with them in a tent. It was called the tabernacle. It was King David who first wanted to build God a building, a house, a temple to reside in. And it was David's son Solomon that God chose for this project. We, my friends, are citizens of two kingdoms. You know that? We are. We are citizens of two kingdoms. The kingdom of this world, these United States, and citizens of a heavenly kingdom by virtue of our faith, by virtue of our baptism, by virtue of what God has done for us. We are citizens of a heavenly kingdom. We must remember that each and every day of our Christian lives here on earth. And so this body that we have this life that we have, these jobs that we have, and cars that we have, and homes that we have, and relationships that we have, all of it. In this life, these are the tent of our earthly home, says Paul. And the truth is, in one way or another, all of those things are wasting away. Being destroyed, coming to an end. But what we have waiting for us in heaven, the body we have waiting for us in heaven, the kingdom, the care, the provision, the relationships, those things that are eternal in heaven, they are a building. And not like a building in this world that slowly falls apart, but a house from God, not made with human hands, but eternal in the heavens. And while we are pilgrims and sojourners in this world, we are preparing for our future in Christ. As Christians, we are called to be content with this life while reaching for the life that is to come. And that waiting, that reaching, is often hard, and often painful, and it is certainly something we cannot do alone. But rather, we have been called into the church, and we have called, been called to be the church, to 
together. Paul continues, verses 2 through 4. He says, for in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed. So that what is mortal may be swallowed up by love. What in the world is that? <laughs> groaning for more in this tent is precisely what <clears throat> he says. It's groaning for more of a good thing. Groaning for more of what God has done. Groaning for more. Not groaning for something different. Not groaning that God would realize his mistake in creation and change the creation, or that we would be turned into a different sort of creation, like robots or something. Groaning for more is not, and hear me, my friends, is not seeking to float away into heaven, sitting on a cloud, playing a harp, being fitted for your rings. Wings, rings? Wings, I would say, wings. We are not waiting to shed our physical bodies, but rather that the death that dwells in them, in you, the God. Paul says we are longing, groaning, to put on our heavenly dwelling, not that we would be unclothed, but further clothed. Not that we would take off, shed the husk, of this simple broken body, but that we would put on the real thing. That we would put on the undying thing, the perfect thing, the eternal thing, the real thing. That our tent would be exchanged for a building from God. Not that life created by God would change, but that death residing in this world because of man's sin would be completely and utterly swallowed up in life. And until then, the question is, what gets us by? What powers the church? What keeps us together? What keeps us in this hope? Well, the question is really not a what, but a who does this. Verse 5, Paul says, He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. It is the Holy Spirit that is your guarantee and my guarantee. It's a Greek word, our aboni. Guarantee it's a first installment of a payment plan. That's what it means. It's a down payment for you. It's not your down payment for God, but the down payment he has given you. The down payment on the kingdom of God to come, on the life that is to come, the down payment on the complete and total care, provision, love, and fulfillment of living in the presence of God that is to come, the Holy Spirit is the guarantee of that. That Holy Spirit who gives us faith, the Holy Spirit that guides and directs our lives. And it is life in Him. It is life in that Spirit to which Paul dedicates the second half of his epic letter to the Romans. Christian life in the Spirit points us to the life that is to come. And my friends, that does not take you out of this world. It does not take me out of this world. It does not. But rather, it directs us to be more intentionally interested and involved in what is happening in this world. Because the kingdom of God is near. Because the kingdom of God is at hand. Because the kingdom of God is imminent. It is the coming kingdom of God that teaches us how to live like in the spirit. And teaches us to live according to that spirit. It is the coming kingdom of God that teaches us to share the good news of forgiveness and of life in Christ's name. It is the coming kingdom of God that teaches us 
to care for one another's temporal needs. It is the coming kingdom of God that teaches us in this life to be content while we groan to be complete. Verses 6 through 8 of our epistle reading, he says, So we are always of good courage. Paul said that. He's about to be beheaded, by the way. We are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. You see, the question is an easy one. Which is better? Easy. It would be better to leave this broken body behind and await the resurrection in the kingdom of God at home with our Lord. It would be better and easier right now for us to be with him, to be in his paradise. It would be better for us, but it might not be better for the people around us. To those who yet are yet to know Christ, to those that he has called us to love and to care for and to heal and to share the truth of Christ, to those in our homes and in our workplaces, those amongst our families and our friends, for them it is good for us to be here in the days of our earthly life that God has given us so that we would be the church. So that we would be the hands and the feet and the voice of Jesus in this world. Friends, you and I are here by God's choice. Here. You are here. You are alive in this world by God's choice and by His design. For a reason, for a purpose. Find joy in Him and rejoice in the work that He has given you to do here and now for a little while, says Ecclesiastes, as we await the eternal. And in all of it, and in all of it, I'm going to leave you with one final encouragement, and it is from Christ Himself, it is from His servant on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. He says this Seek First, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all of these things will be added to you. Seek first, primarily, chiefly, most importantly, and before anything else, the kingdom of God. That is the necessary pursuit in this life. We look for never-ending life to come with our Savior. Amen. May the peace of God who surpasses all understanding guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would prepare your people, that you would prepare us for your coming kingdom, that you would not only prepare us as the church, that you would send us out to call all people to you. That they might know that Christ died for them and loves them. That they are invited into your eternal peace, your eternal home in our heavenly kingdom. Lord, we ask that you would keep our eyes, that you would enable us to keep those eyes focused on you and your kingdom above all, in all, in this life. So that we might have a peace that passes all understanding. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand and join me as we sing?
the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus, and for all people according to their needs. O Most High God, we give thanks to you that you have planted your holy word among us. Give healthy growth to your church that she may weather the storm of this world, steadfast in Christ, ever bearing the fruits of love and singing praises to your name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, your Holy Spirit plants your word and causes it to sprout and grow as it pleases you. Bless the preaching and teaching of your word that your kingdom may be extended and give us thankful hearts to marvel at your work. Send faithful laborers into your fields to scatter your seed here and abroad, that in due time a harvest may be reaped for your glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, you are the great I am. What you have spoken, you will surely do. We implore you for the sake of Christ and your many precious promises to bless and defend our homes, to make the efforts of parents fruitful in the teaching of their children, and to preserve them in the saving faith of Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Eternal Lord, who are ruler of all, graciously regard those who have been set in positions of authority. Guide them by your spirit to be high in purpose and wise in counsel, firm in good resolution and unwavering in their duty, that under them we may be governed quietly and peaceably. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. Father, we are bold to ask for all things because you have given us your spirit as a guarantee. Hear us as we intercede in Jesus' name for those who are in every need. Lord, this day we ask that you would um, bless Clark and Mary Halbert's great-granddaughter, Scarlett, who was born with a heart issue, Lord, um, who will be needing um, some sort of treatment for that in the days coming. Lord, we ask that that might be successful and that you might bless her through that, that she might be healed totally and completely. Lord, we ask that you be with Richard Grant, who is preparing to travel to see uh, a friend who's passing away in L.A., uh, that he would have safe travels to and from. We ask that you would bless Sterling also during that time. Lord, we ask that you do have Brother Gary Martin, who's uh, waiting on some important uh, test results concerning his health. Lord, we ask that um, those might be favorable and that the plan that the uh, medical staff is preparing for him uh, would be for his benefit and that he would receive um, healing through that. Continue prayers this day and always, Lord, for um, those who are sick and suffering in any way. Tonight we think of Abigail Geisler in the hospital, Lord. We ask that you would continue to bless her with healing, continue to bless her with improvement um, that the family has been seeing. We give you great thanks. Uh, we ask for more. Lord, we ask that you would give comfort um, to the family caring for her in this time and wisdom to the medical staff working with her. Lord, in your mercy, hear yeah. our prayer. O God, we've grown under many burdens in this earthly tent and long to be clothed with your eternal life, which will swallow up all mortal sorrow. Give courage to your servants to walk by faith and not sight, to mourn our dead in the hope of the resurrection, and to make it our aim to please you while here in the body, until at last we are at home with Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy Father, from Israel, you have taken a tender spring. You, your chosen Messiah, Jesus, and planted him on the mountain for our salvation. By his death on the tree, you have reversed the curse of sin and brought life again to dry, dusty souls. Do not let us despise your Christ, his humility, or his suffering, 
but bring us with all your Christians into the shade of his eternal rest. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. O Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. To please Christ is to trust in his word of grace for us. His grace, his forgiveness, his gift of faith by the power of the Holy Spirit assures us that nothing in this world can separate us from him. Judgment Day will be a day of celebration for those who put their trust in him. Dear Lord, impress upon my heart the greatness of your grace to me by the power of your Holy Spirit so I can walk confidently by faith until I see you gloriously face to face. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you and keep you now and forever. Amen. We sing our final song.